أربعة للبودكاست In days of yore, when nights were bold and stories of adventure yet untold. Welcome dear to a new episode of True European Nights podcast, production of Arba. Tonight we will be journeying back in time along with the central figure and first protagonist in every story in Arab history. Who's that protagonist? Why is it behind every glory? Well, when the first flame of Islam lit, it was brought as a famous saying, read, read. This sort of strict dominant command was addressed to a non-reader, to the first and last handler of Islam flag. You see, I'm using the term first a little bit much, but hey, this is the root of our tale tonight. Our protagonist, the little command consisted of one word, read, decided to come to life and started walking around the villages. The villages were dark and gloomy, not because of night, but because the light within the mindsets and hearts was in desperate need to be awakened. So it was the command, read, read as recite, lighten, and awaken. It wasn't merely an invitation to spell out what was written, it was a start of humanity, granting that privilege to its followers. Communities before were overwhelmed by their ignorance, and so it was the time for them not to only receive a divine message, but also a call to knowledge and awareness. Read. The message reached its messenger, the one. The messenger was Prophet Muhammad. Muhammad was a man of his people, so was his reply. When he was commanded to read, he said, I don't read. The command was repeated, read, he said again, I don't read, and then he was told as recited. <laughs> Arabs back then were famous for their finest poetry, as if every part of their day revolved around poetry. It was their asset that they earned, not gained their legacy, and even their first tongue. They would say poems before writing and reading. Arabs also had large local markets, a souk as in Arabic, that were just for boats to have competitions for the best Arab tongues. One of those famous local markets was a um, uh, souk hukab. Prophet Muhammad, on the other hand, was merely illiterate, and for sure, butchery was never his thing. That's the reason he was shocked by the command of read. And very, very despite that, Muhammad decided to make knowledge and education an ultimate aim for his people to build up a well steady foundation for Islamic world that was about to start. And then there was the first school that Arabs called Kutab or Kitatib as plural. A kutab is a traditional Islamic elementary school where children learn fundamental skills like reading, writing, and grammar, as well as religious studies such as memorizing and reciting Quran. And when I say children, I mean very little children because Arabs set knowledge as a face of manpower that one should gain at a very early age, and so did they. Kutab teachers were used to be referred to as sheikh and played a crucial role in shaping young minds. They instilled not only academic knowledge, but also moral values and a love for learning. Every kutab was of a historical significance that remains undeniable. They were instrumental in preserving Islamic heritage and nurturing generations of scholars and thinkers. The first kutab was Bar al Arqam, that was secretly founded and preserved. 
Well, friends, when those who got knowledge very young at Akutab started taking a higher level of knowledge that differs them zero from scientists, if not were they the scientists themselves, they used absurd knowledge in their Moscow's that were turned at a later stage into universities. Some of those famous Arab universities were Al-Azhar University, Cairo, Egypt, University of Karwin, Fez, Morocco, the House of Wisdom, Baghdad, Iraq, and the list gets longer. The Islamic Golden Age started its journey, spanning the 18th to the 13th centuries, significantly influencing the European world. Muslim scholars made substantial contributions to various fields, including medicine, mathematics, astronomy, philosophy, architecture. Through trade, cultural exchange, Islamic knowledge and innovations were transmitted to Europe. This intellectual exchange played a pivotal role in the European Renaissance. Muslim scholars translated and preserved ancient Greek texts, particularly those of Aristotle, which laid the groundwork for the revival of classic learning in Europe. The Islamic Golden Age, a period of remarkable intellectual and scientific advancement, produced countless brilliant minds of most influential thinkers. Even Sina, who experienced a unique educational journey, benefited from his father's interest in his education. He entered the Qutab at the age of five, where he began memorizing the Qur'an and learning the basic principles of fiqh, Islamic jurisprudence, and Sharia Islamic law. By the age of ten, he had completed the memorization of the Qur'an, excelling in fiqh and religious sciences, which draw attention to his intelligence and early genius. By the time he turned 16, his interest shifted towards natural and medical sciences. He began studying medicine under local physicians, quickly surpassing them and even treating patients, mastering medical sciences at a young age. In addition to medicine, Ibn Sina delved into astronomy, logic, and philosophy, reading the works of Aristotle and their commentaries, which sparked his desire for a deeper understanding of intellectual sciences. That's not all. By the age of eating, Ibn Sina had acquired comprehensive knowledge in most sciences available at that time. And it can be said that he had completed his formal education due to his extensive reading and excellence in various fields. Nevertheless, he continued to seek knowledge throughout his life, reading and writing about medicine, philosophy and astronomy until his death, believing that knowledge is a continuous journey. For Al-Khawarizmi, he began his basic education around six years old in the Qutab. This was foundational to any education in the Islamic world at that time. Once he completed his initial education, Al-Khawarizmi deepened his studies in other sciences such as astronomy and geography, exploring them in his late teenager years and early 20s. Al-Khawarizmi's knowledge of mathematics matured and he began writing books, with his most notable work being Al-Jabr wal which laid the foundations for modern algebra. These were very famous scholars, and the situation was no different for military leaders or rulers. The same educational system applied. For example, Salah al-Din began his education at early age, studying Islamic jurisprudence and the Qur'an, receiving instructions from well-known scholars of his time. He also took lessons in Arabic literature and poetry. Salah al-Din was influenced by the scholars and military leaders around him. 
he would listen to their lessons and engage in discussions, helping shape his political and military vision. These practical experiences were fundamental in honing his leadership skills, highlighting his tragic qualities. Although he was not a scholar, his religious and historical knowledge was crucial in shaping his military strategies. Salah ad-Din did not become a scholar himself, instead he chose to be a leader, an influencer. He utilized his knowledge of fiqh and military sciences to build a strong state and promote Islamic unity. He established an educational system to support the army and society, encouraging the establishment of schools and libraries. His reign witnessed a flourishing of sciences and arts as he promoted education, helping develop many scholars during his era. This was a quick overview of some great Muslims' figures and certainly their greatness steamed from the educational approach they received, which differs significantly from the prevailed methods today. Now, let me tell you how Islamic educational system was, along with its features, understanding why Muslims excelled in the past. We will, of course, compare that to modern education. The systematic philosophy of classical Islamic education is based on several fundamental principles aimed at building a comprehensive and balanced scientific personality, linking knowledge and action, and nurturing ethics and religion alongside intellectual and practical sciences. You see, classic Islamic education integrated religious sciences such as Quran and jurisprudence with rational sciences like medicine, astronomy, philosophy, considering that human knowledge should serve faith and be connected to ethics and values. While today, there's often a separation between religious education and academic learning, with sciences studied from a perspective independent of religious values separating academic and spiritual studies. As I said before, classic Islamic education relayed individual mentorship, where students received knowledge directly from their teachers or sheikh, enhancing personal communication and allowing room for personal advice and guidance. We can notice that the modern education has shifted toward group instruction in large classrooms, reducing opportunities for individual monitoring, and moving toward institutional education where the teacher's role as a personal monitor diminishes. An unending journey that's how scholars viewed learning as continuing their studies and research even after what was known as the completion of education. For instance, Ibn Sina continued to read and research throughout his whole life. Our modern education of today represents most curricula as structured around completing specific educational stages with set timelines for graduation. Although there is a growing interest in continuous education and self-directed learning through um, online platforms, for example, I think that both now and back then serves knowledge, but it differs in constancy and productivity. We say in Arabic, learning younger sculptures knowledge. The classic Islamic educational philosophy adopted a comprehensive approach that integrates religious and ethical values, linking knowledge with practical experience while providing personalized guidance to each student. In contrast, modern education tends to separate disciplines, focusing heavily on theoretical aspects in early stages and moving toward group learning. Why the modern system benefits from high specialization and advanced scientific tools, it often lacks the holistic educational approach that connects knowledge with faith and moral cultivation, a hallmark of classic Islamic education. 
These freelant minds, along with many others, propelled the Islamic world to the forefront of scientific and intellectual advancement. Their contributions continue to shape the understanding of the world and inspire future generations of thinkers and innovators. Do Arabs need to claim their supremacy? Is it preserved anyway? If you are aware of Arab contributions similar to these or even more, leave me your comments. Your thoughts are as always valued. That was Asma Amin of True European Night. Stay tuned for the next captivating tale. And until then, don't forget to subscribe, like, and share this episode with your beloved ones. Goodbye.